And I'm glad everyone could join us this evening as we have uh, Professor Andrew Rome from the College of Business Administration. Um, he is currently, in a few days, celebrating his ninth anniversary at Northeast University, uh, I believe in two to three days. So just wanted to say early happy anniversary. <laughs> Tonight we have Professor Rome speaking on Brand in the Hand, Marketing Communications in the 21st Century. Besides being the Associate Professor within the Department of Marketing, he's also the Term Professor for the Denise and Robert DiCenzo Professorship, and he's also the Co-Director of the Executive MBA Program. He received his PhD in Marketing from the University of Massachusetts and his Bachelor of Science degree from the University of Michigan where, believe it or not, he studied aerospace engineering. His research interests include new media and innovations in marketing, communications and branding, and he has also published several journals and articles in, in the MIT Sloan Management of Review, journals, jur journals of business research, as well as the Journal of Interactive Marketing. And I could go on and on, but I won't. And he's also very involved on campus as well, and um, we have two of his students here this evening. Um, but he's also, before he joined Northeastern, he was um, actually Director of Marketing at the Rebark International Company. He worked at Brook Sports, and he also worked in General Motors in Detroit. And once again, I could go on and on, but I won't. I will allow Professor Room to come and embark his knowledge and insight to you this evening. Professor Room. Uh, yeah, I think okay. it, can you hear, well, you'll hear me. Can you hear? Okay, great. Yeah, I'm from Detroit, and as you might have seen on TV, there's a new show, Detroit 187. I don't know what 187 stands for, but I'm sure it paints a pretty bleak picture, picture of, I think, a pretty fascinating city. I'm not here to talk about Detroit, but that is my upbringing, and I think having grew up, grown up in Detroit, it instills a sense of paranoia. And, and that's probably reflected in my, my um, random career walk from aerospace engineer to a director of marketing at Reebok to an associate professor here at Northeastern. Um, being that I'm always looking, you know, kind of at the next, uh, you know, what's next in, in, in my life. And I'm really happy to be at Northeastern. This is my ninth year anniversary. Um, special thanks to Rija for inviting me, to Jack and Lori. Uh, Sarah, the wonderful people who set this up. Um, you may have heard that I, I did spend time at Michigan and also at UMass, and I think it's, it's just ironic that this coming weekend, or in two weekends, UMass will be playing Michigan in football, um, which um, I wish the best for Michigan because UMass has a powerhouse this year. Um, I'm here to talk about brand in the hand, and brand in the hand is a, is a term that we, uh, my colleagues and I, uh, came up with after working with uh, another sporting goods company, Adidas International in Amsterdam. Um, through my travels with Northeastern and my former time at Reebok, I met people in the industry. And so I was fortunate enough to work with Adidas. And that's how Adidas described their mobile marketing efforts. Mobile meaning a mobile device like a smartphone, a Blackberry, an iPhone. Um, and they felt that, that this, this mobile device that was becoming more and more powerful through um, soon to be third generation data and um, uh, communication services allowed companies to communicate with, with potential consumers or customers um, with this device that they carried in their hands. So um, over the past five or six years, my research has um, been all about um, new forms of communication, and that's what I'm here to talk to you about, new forms of marketing, communication, and, and advertising. Um, this is a, there's one thing uh, an example of despise more new than anything forms, else. what companies like Procter & Gamble are doing it's to sell nice. products. Folgers Coffee created TolerateMornings.com, a portal to mornings that are less of a pain in the arse. This is how we got them there. This is a commercial put together by Saatchi and Saatchi in New York City to promote coffee usage. Hello world, we're shining so bright. 
A new day is here, it's really dynamite! Feel the love! Save the joy, get the rainbow for each joy and boy! On this hour, happy morning! We also did some print, which showed how the dreaded alarm clock ruins dreams. And some other stuff. Once they were there, we armed them with tools to help them through their most difficult period of the day. A boss tracker that, once they entered their office layout, enabled them to keep an eye on their boss's movements. for those late starts, a selection of auto email responses that replied to early emails with a, thanks for the email, but I'll be out of the office most of the morning. Right now I'm still at home helping to deliver our brand new puppies. Life is such a miracle. Instead of being woken by the dreaded beep of an alarm clock, TolerateMornings.com visitors could select from a series of pleasant wake-ups. Each was downloadable to your cell phone. Oh, wake up, gorgeous. Morning is here. It's time to let the world get a look at those big, beautiful eyes. This is your wake up call. It's time to get up. While I'm here, let me just say you are awesome. Like pyramids. Good morning, beautiful. It's time to get your sweetness up and out of bed. While this alternating screensaver showed that even your computer can wake up with Folgers. TolerateMornings.com, making mornings more tolerable. Thanks for watching! Weird, huh? This is the type of work that global advertising or marketing communications agencies are putting together uh, to cut through this clutter of existing traditional TV, print, billboard, advertising. And so I was thinking about a theme for my, my talk with all of you tonight, and I thought it's all about persuasion. For those of you who have tried to persuade someone, and I'm sure that includes everyone in this room, what do you think works if you're trying to get your spouse or significant other, your lazy boyfriend, to go get off the couch and go to the movies with you? How do you persuade someone? And this is where I'm asking for a little bit of audience participation. I'm not going to saw anyone in half or make you disappear, but how do you persuade? Make it interesting to them. You make it interesting to them. All right. Great. Any other thoughts? It's bargaining. bargaining. Okay, so it's a win-win. If you do this, I'll do that. A couple of other ideas. We have um, make it interesting to them or relevant. Yes, Lindsay. Okay, what's in it for them? And there was another. I'm sorry? Guilt. Okay, make them feel guilty. Like you didn't buy my product. You must feel guilty. Um, I think. You know, traditional advertising and marketing communications was all about persuasion. But if you think about a typical Super Bowl spot, it's a it's a it's a it's a thirty second piece of airtime that companies will pay upwards of two and a half to three million dollars for a thirty second um, spot on whatever network carries the Super Bowl. Is it effective? 
What happens if we're at the refrigerator grabbing another beer, we're talking to our friend, uh, we don't notice the commercial, we have to run to the men's room or women's, you know, the ladies' room. Um, there's no guarantee that we're either in front of the TV and that we're tuned in. But the, the advantage of traditional media like TV is that it affords companies reach in terms of the 80 million people that might tune into a Super Bowl in any given year. But if you think about TV, it's a broadcast medium. And that's exactly what broadcast did. It, it casts a very broad net over individuals, over viewers, in the hopes that some of them will tune into your message, in the hopes that some of them are actually uh, maybe interested um, in what you're trying to sell them, similar to what your point was in terms of persuading someone, is it of interest to them? So it's, it's a very shotgun approach to trying to persuade people. This um, screenshot is of a campaign put together by BMW about 10 years ago called BMW Films. Uh, and this was revolutionary in what BMW did is it went beyond totally against the, um, the paradigm of let's broadcast our message to as many people as we can reach via networks or cable TV and hope that they like what we're telling them. This was a totally internet-based campaign featuring short films of five, six, seven minutes showing the car, uh, but not a, not, not a, a, a traditional um, uh, t uh, autom automobile commercial where the car is beautiful and it's driving down a, a nice curvy country road in New England. These cars were being shot at. They were um, dirty. They were um, filled with some scenes, some pretty graphic scenes of, of people bleeding to death in back seats. Um, and it was, it was striking in that BMW chose to, um, to avoid TV and go straight to the internet with this, with this campaign. And it was a huge success in terms of views. Um, the series generated about 10 million film views um, in the first several weeks of the campaign. Two million people took time to register at the BMW.com um, site. And uh, a large percentage indicated that they would purchase a BMW as their next automobile. So this campaign created a sense of intimacy with, um, with these people who actually chose to go and view the, the message. It wasn't pushed upon them. They kind of pulled it into them. Um, and whether you view intimacy as love or respect or trust or just a closeness and an engagement that we couldn't uh, historically generate from a 30-second commercial, um, BMW felt that this was um, a big success. About two years after the BMW Films campaign, a little bit after my time with Reebok, Reebok introduced this guy named Terry Tate. Do you all know Terry Tate? He was an office linebacker, meaning he would tackle people very aggressively in offices if they left a copy jam in the copier, if they stole someone's food in someone's refrigerator. The beauty of the Terry Tate campaign for Reebok was they were struggling as a, as a brand that wasn't known as being cool with 12 to 17 year old pretty much males. What Reebok did was they advertised this character on the Super Bowl to gain reach and they um, uh, distributed or, or um, they showed place films showing Terry Tate, um, the commercial and four minute films, short films on their website. So they created a microsite for Terry Tate. They generated the uh, awareness of the campaign through the Super Bowl, which reaches lots of people around the United States. Uh, but they added intimacy or a level of engagement to the equation uh, with the internet-based component of the, of the campaign. When I was in Amsterdam, um, working with Adidas, they had just introduced a World Cup mobile portal, which means they were able to bring uh, the World Cup to people's cell phones, smartphones. And this is in 2006, and that's when 3G or third generation cell phone usage in Europe uh, was, um, was reaching a pretty high percentage. So uh, people, consumers in Europe, had the ability, the wherewithal, to um, to download um, information about the World Cup that was customized to various countries in Europe. This was really striking to me because it, it showed how a brand like Adidas using a mobile device was able to reach people uh, through um, the, the large penetration of cell phones in Europe. It was able to reach people with a level of engagement and intimacy plus reach them based upon their location. 
Uh, now you, may, you might say, well, you know, what's so important about location? That, if you, if, you, if you think about advertising now and marketing communications and branding, location is, um, is really the, the buzzword and the keyword. And that is reaching people where it matters. In this case, with Adidas, it was reaching people who were attending games or viewing games in bars and pubs and, and venues across, across Europe. Because in the heat of the moment, as you're watching a game, what better way to kind of um, present a relevant message to them uh, than when they're watching um, you know, their favorite sporting event, the World Cup, on TV. This is a, a chart that simply says the marketing landscape is changing, and it's changing really rapidly. Um, the neat thing, I'm going to step away from the um, microphone. The neat thing about this chart is it shows, for instance, the telephone took 89 years to reach 150 million users. Facebook, in January of 2009, reached 150 million users in less than five years. So it's with social media and innovations in, in digital platforms, um, new platforms and new ways and venues for market marketers and brands to um, communicate with customers um, can, can gain scale really, really rapidly. Um, the million dollar question is, do you know how many users Facebook now has around the world? Yeah, it's like one in 12 people around the world. One of 12, meaning six billion people, one of them are on Facebook. Um, is, well, Bob, you're going to be on Facebook tomorrow. I can, I can tell. This is <laughs> so. The, I guess the motivation behind my research and my colleagues' research at Northeastern within the College of Business Administration comes from my uh, my interest, and I guess I'm, I was intrigued by how fast marketing communications is is happening. Twenty years ago, if you were a media planner, you put together a TV plan, a print plan, probably out of home or uh, some billboards and maybe some radio. Um, this is before the internet. And you were pretty much you know, done for the day. Now it's a much, much more complex phenomenon. And that's what led me to my interest in these three streams of research. One is uh, the use of handheld devices, mobile devices, and marketing, how brands are now seeking to establish relationships with consumers via um, cell phones. Um, and that leads to this idea of concept of brand in the hand. We've also worked with um, young consumers, college-age students across China, Pakistan, the U.S., and Europe to try to look at differences between uh, consumer acceptance of mobile marketing um, within these markets. And if you think about it, um, what is it about a cell phone or a mobile phone that makes it different than a TV or even a desktop or a laptop? It's with you, sometimes 24-7. Uh, and that means that it can be a more personal device and that messages that come to you on these phones better not be unsolicited, they better not be spam, um, and because it can be very intrusive to receive unwanted messages on this very personal device. Quick quiz, I don't know if, um, if uh, Jack prepared you with this quiz we're having tonight. It's gonna be graded. No, really quickly, what are these brands ranging from Adidas to Sprite to Volvo to financial securities or financial services in Wachovia have in common? This should be a no-brainer because I've been talking about it for the last two or three minutes. These are brands from very different industries, but they have one thing in common. They, they have a significant mobile presence, but they're, they're also looking at um, these devices, mobile devices, as a form of marketing. And I just found it interesting that shoes, soft drinks, uh, cars, and financial services are all looking at this mobile platform as a way to either maintain or develop relationships with current or, or new customers. This is someone that we all might um, resemble. She's Barbara and she's an appaholic, meaning she has an app to wake her in the morning, to show her the day's news, to check her bank account, um, another app to make a grocery list, two, to track her diet, one, to get the weather. So now we're up to like, I don't know, six or seven um, iPhone or smartphone apps. She has an app, she's a baseball fan, so of course she has to have an app for checking baseball scores, um, an app for movie data, maybe um, Fandango. Uh, one lets her program her DVR from afar, and another helps her unwind with quizzes about famous artworks, and that's just a portion. She says, my husband is jealous of my iPhone, 
Um, so I try hard not to use it in bed. <laughs> so these, Barbara, we understand you. Uh, we sympathize with your, with your husband. Um, so I want to run through um, just four very quick streams of research that we've covered um, in my work at Northeastern. One is a case study we wrote on Adidas's use of um, the mobile platform for two different events. One was a, a sporting event, the Euro 2004 football championships, or soccer as we say in the United States. And one was featuring, do you know who this little thumbnail? Caitlin, you know who this is. Missy Elliott. So Adidas said, wow, we want to reach young consumers. In Europe, it was through football. In the US, it was through Missy Elliott. Um, and that was how, you know, how important this, this mobile device was to them um, in reaching people, kids, whose phones were their lifeline. If you ask our students now at Northeastern, what would happen if you lost your phone? They cringe, they cry, they like break out in hives and they, in cold sweats and they say, I would rather come to class naked than, well, they don't really say that, but um, they, they would rather leave their wallet, their keys, their textbooks, anything at home but their cell phones. So it is a big deal. And companies, brands like Adidas saw that and recognized that and wanted to try to you know, leverage this platform um, and work with them. We also looked at um, the initiatives um, through the World Cup in 2006, which I um, just mentioned. And this is a, um, an initiative or a campaign that Adidas put together that allowed them to reach about 2 million soccer fans around the world uh, with relevant, meaningful, value-added, fun, entertainment, entertaining content regarding uh, these people's favorite sport, um, soccer. And it was a big success in terms of the cost to develop this campaign versus the number of people you re it reached. Now, some of you um, Northeastern graduates who have gone on to um, finance or accounting or jobs that involve numbers, and sometimes we do try to teach numbers and marketing at, at Northeastern, might say, well, that pales in comparison to 80 million people that you could reach on the Super Bowl, but there's a fundamental difference, and that is the people that um, came and, and, and um, uh, pulled in this portal to their phone chose to do that. They were in control. They weren't being forced a message upon, the, the, the message wasn't being forced upon them. It wasn't intrusive. It was something that they chose to, um, to interact with. And that was a fundamental difference that Adidas, this global brand, um, found in terms of, gee, it's better to engage people with content that is in, of interest to them as opposed to something that we think is of interest to the consumer in a, in a monologue versus a dialogue. And then lastly, we looked at um, this idea of the acceptance, consumer acceptance of mobile marketing across markets around the world. Um, so my colleagues, Farina Sultan and Tony Gao, uh, within the marketing group at Northeastern are um, surveying and, and working with um, college students at Northeastern at two universities in China, uh, a couple in Pakistan, Lahore, Pakistan, and um, a university, a kind of a pan-Europe university in uh, Milan, Italy, to look at how drivers of consumer acceptance or outcomes of consumer acceptance differ across these markets. So just by way of definition, um, I'm not, this is not something you have to remember, but mobile marketing is all about allowing organizations or companies to communicate with us individuals in ways uh, that are more interactive and perhaps more relevant because of our location or our interests. Um, and this brand in the hand concept is, again, as I mentioned, the convergence of this, this hardware, this mobile device, and the internet, uh, the wireless internet. It's interesting that almost five billion out of six plus billion people around the world are mobile phone subscribers. That's a huge, huge number. Um, the U.S., surprisingly, is somewhat a laggard in mobile phone usage. Why is that? What do you think? Pardon me? Yeah. Right. In, in Europe or China or um, Korea, uh, you know, Africa, um, you get an A, by the way. Um, <laughs> we, the, um, we've been spoiled. We've had um, landline phones. And, and, and to, to, to order a landline phone in China, I mean, it takes years, if not months. It's expensive. And the mobile phone for um, 
uh, people that fish for a living in Egypt or uh, are farmers in Africa, that is their, their um, link to commerce and to both a social network and a commercial network. So yeah, the US, in, ironically, I guess, in that we lead in you know, innovation in, in many areas, uh, we've been, I guess, the baggage of our um, uh, significant broadband investments and landline investments have um, somewhat uh, you know, deterred us, but we're gaining fast. Um, I guess more interesting to me is this um, number at the bottom of the screen which talks about location-based mobile spending, meaning spending by companies on campaigns that reach people dependent on their location um, will grow exponentially within the next five years. Now there's an off talked about, uh, I don't know if it's a myth or reality, but you're walking by your favorite Starbucks, for example, and you got your phone on, and what happens? What what do you get on your phone as you're walking by your neighborhood Starbucks? Somehow Starbucks knows maybe you've entered your, you registered your um, Starbucks account with your phone, you get an uh, offer for uh, a muffin or you know come in and buy a muffin and get a free um, latte. That's location-based marketing. Um, and I'm convinced that it is the next phase of um, marketing, promotions, branding, um, and advertising. What we found from our work, and this was published in the um, Sloan Management Review, and it's part of the article that, um, that I think we have as a handout, is that there's a fundamental difference between mobile marketing and the other kinds, TV, print, traditional, or even fixed tethered internet. And that is the two dimensions of uh, mobile marketing is based upon location, or it can be based upon location, and it's highly interactive. And our thought was that there is not a medium um, out there that offers the same level or degree of interactivity uh, with that ability to be location dependent, meaning you're, you're with your phone um, wherever you might be. We also looked at the role of phones within emerging markets, namely Pakistan and China. Um, and it's, I, I spent some time in Europe and we traveled to um, Egypt with my three children. And you see, literally, you see fishermen on, with their boats on the Nile. And they've, they've got no shoes on their feet, but they have their cell phone, their mobile phone. And that is their, again, their link uh, to not only a social network, but a commercial network. Um, so it was kind of interesting to compare the U.S. leaders in innovation in many areas with uh, young consumers in these other markets. And we found some really interesting um, things. And I apologize in advance. I'm showing you a framework. I know this is like the, the, ten, the first thing not to do during a dinnertime talk, and that is show models or um, frameworks that we're testing. But let me just simplify it for you. Um, on the left side, on your left side, we wanted to look at how the device was easy, easy to use, and was it useful? Was it perceived as easy to use, meaning this smartphone or mobile device, and was it perceived as um, useful? So was it easy to use, was it, and how did that lead to people's attitudes about, not the phone, but mobile marketing, marketing messages um, delivered via the phone? But then we thought, well, maybe there are some individual characteristics, like innovators, people that see themselves as um, mavens when it comes to technology, maybe that will kind of moderate the relationship between the hardware and their attitudes towards mobile marketing. So we call that innovativeness. And then we also wanted to look at this idea of personal attachment. Well, the, the, the concept that this phone is a personal thing. I carry it with me. It's my lifeline. I don't want to leave home without it. Will that affect the relationship between these device characteristics and our attitudes towards mobile marketing? And then we wanted to look at, of course, privacy concerns or risk perception. Does my um, uh, ability or at least my um, perception that I want to avoid risk influence this relationship? by not wanting to receive unwanted messages or um, offers on my phone. And then downstream to the right, we wanted to look at, gee, does attitude towards marketing messages delivered on my phone lead to greater acceptance? But not just permission-based or opt-in acceptance, meaning I give permission for companies to target me or to send offers to me, but non-permission-based. If I haven't given companies permission, how does that affect um, mobile activity, meaning 
um, do I download um, offers, coupons, mobile coupons? Do I use them? Am I interested in offers from companies that um, are maybe sending me things of value for um, uh, on my phone? And we found some really interesting um, things. I think the most interesting is that there were a lot less differences and more similarities among 18 to 22 year olds across these four, three markets, US, China, and um, Europe, as well as a fourth market, Pakistan. And what that means to me is that there are these you know, universal appeals to kids around the world um, that don't differ depending on, you know, they're universal, so they don't differ depending on, on the market. We also found that, um, kind of puzzling, in China, they, China, the young kids we, we talked or we surveyed had the lowest acceptance, perceived or indicated perception, acceptance rates for mobile marketing, meaning they did, they did wanted nothing to do with it. Yet, their mobile activity scores were the highest. So are they lying to us by saying, we don't want, uh, we won't accept these things on our phones, however, their behaviors were, um, were totally counter to that. And what we think it is, is, is that um, perhaps these, um, their, their perception of privacy um, is, is one that doesn't, lead, doesn't necessarily um, uh, lend itself to the phone because that's all they have. Um, they don't have a computer at home. Maybe they don't have a landline. Um, they haven't maybe been barraged by uh, intrusive TV advertisements like other cultures. So we found that disconnect really um, interesting and we're still trying to kind of put our arms around it in an article that we're working on at this um, moment in time. So just quick food for thought wrapping up this um, idea of, of mobile marketing. And that is um, attitude towards the idea of marketing on my phone was central to acceptance. So if you can enhance people's attitudes, thoughts or beliefs about this idea that I can receive coupons or offers of value, then that can be a direct um, influence on their acceptance and activity. Uh, firms should realize, global firms, local firms should realize that uh, there are a lot of similarities uh, amongst customers or consumers, individuals, young individuals across these seemingly disparate uh, markets. It's important in, um, in any web-based approach where you're, you're reaching a smaller number of people to also look at other mediums like TV to cross-promote, to create awareness, and to create scale. And that's exactly what we found that Reebok did with the, um, with the Terry Tate um, campaign. And then, I guess at a general level, um, and Adidas executives told us this, it was much better in 2004 and 2005 to experiment and fail in this relatively unproven, um, uh, you know, pioneering new ground in, in mobile. They wanted to be at the, at the leading edge, and therefore they thought if we're going to lead our industry in mobile, we have to fail before we can move forward. And a lot of companies, I think, would have been, um, uh, you know, looked at that as, as a bit too risky. And that is, we don't want to fail, we want to, you know, succeed. But they knew that there were going to be failures because it was such a new, untested, uh, and, un and, and acceptance levels were, were relatively low because it was such a, a, a new platform. Second study, and I'm going to make this, um, this has pictures, so I think this will um, be interesting to you. It's all about multitasking. A raise of hands in the room of those of us who do not multitask. I think a lot of us multitask. Um, here are some maybe scary statistics for those of us with young kids or grandkids or those of us who are looking to raise kids in the future. Almost nine out of 10 US children are online by the seventh grade. Okay, that's great. I mean, they're probably working, you know, doing this for schoolwork, but between Club Penguin and um, those insidious stuffed animals, um, what are they, Webkins. Webkins um, to other online sites, it's something that we as parents are, you know, concerned with. 80% of teens in a recent Kaiser Family Foundation study indicated that they use multiple forms of media at one time. So they're watching TV and surfing the internet. And then this was really interesting, that in terms of looking at media consumption, this Kaiser Family Foundation study showed that because of media multitasking or the simultaneous consumption of media, we're able to consume eight and a half hours of media in only six hours, or six and a half hours. 
So this time compression phenomenon where I'm able to do more in less time. So now, you know, if you, if you do multitask in a, in a media sense, you're on your Facebook account. Come on, people, fess up. Um, we're maybe watching a video on YouTube. Uh, we're tweeting on Twitter. Uh, we're buying something on Amazon. We're watching TV or a DVD at the same time. And of course, our handy dandy smartphone is in our hands and we're probably texting or checking emails via, via that. And this is all about doing a lot of different things related to um, media all at one time. So what we wanted to do was look at, gee, how do our students at Northeastern, a proxy for young consumers, multitask? And how does it affect their comprehension of advertising messages? So we went at it in a multi-method approach. We conducted surveys, but not just paper surveys or online surveys. We pinged them every four hours for a week. So four times a day, every four hours, 10 to 6 and 10, with text messages that they would respond to via text message. Um, so we kind of tried to get the, build in that location um, factor. We talked to them one-on-one -on -one, um, through several dozen interviews. We had them write essays about their multitasking and media consumption. We had them cut out pictures in magazines and, and depict their media consumption via posters or collages. And then most recently, we had them keep diaries, uh, weekly diaries, daily diaries of their media consumption. And we found some pretty interesting things, that a significant portion of their days are invested in multitasking. Um, it's a normal part of their life. It's like, well, you know, gee, Professor Rome, this is not rocket science. It's what we do. We're part of the digital generation. Um, this is how we were born. Interestingly, some of them actually said they, uh, they had not clinically diagnosed ADD, but acquired ADD syndrome, that they, were, they felt like they had this, this, this innate need to always be stimulated. Um, and, the, and their attention spans were like a nanosecond. So they always needed to fill dead space with some sort of stimuli. And in their case, it's videos, it's texting, it's um, listening to music, it's watching something on TV, it's surfing. Um, uh, you know, internet sites. With the immersion of the, you know, the availability of smartphones, now this is fast becoming a one and all, all you can eat um, buffet of media. They don't ha need a laptop per se. They don't, well, they still watch TV, but this little thing in their TV is all they, all they need. These are some of the um, collages that were put together. This one reads, when I'm using different media at once, I feel like I'm an operator of a Michigan Mission Impossible. I'm in control. They're in control because of this, this um, array, this vast array of media that they have at their fingertips. And they feel like they're empowered, that they can access and, and kind of go in and out, tune in and out of media as they, um, as they so choose. This one was maybe not as positive and, and maybe concerning, and that is, how do you feel? Well, I feel dazed and confused, like a word for not paying attention to anything. It's blank-mindedness. When I'm watching TV, I'm really doing something else, so I'm not really paying attention to both. Uh, and at the same time, so this was um, a, one of our students who I had in class, so I was a little, no, I, um, she did very well, by the way. Um, in our homework, but this is, you know, kind of a negative side of, of this multitasking generation. And then some were, it was, it was entertaining. It, it, um, it helped them to relax. Maybe ambient noise helped them to focus more on the task at hand. Um, so this collage f featured the word noise, which kind of was a negative, but she said, you know, I need that noise in order to stay focused. I'm not a psychologist, and I don't know how to diagnose this clinically, but it, it does sound kind of interesting. So we came across a paradox. On one hand, there were a lot of positives. They felt more in control. They felt like um, maybe could, they could become, become more efficient in their homework or their media consumption by use of, of simultaneous um, you know, the many devices all at once. They were more productive. They called themselves hyper-connected. They were in, more engaged. Uh, because of this fun, entertaining experience, and they felt like it helped to connect them with others. Maybe in a virtual sense, but still they felt connected. On the negative side, there was chaos and inefficiency. It was distracting, destructive to their work output. Um, they felt that they were disengaged because of the, um, the fact that they weren't able to pay attention to anything in particular, and they felt, in a way, enslaved or addicted to 
uh, the amount of media that's thrown at them or that they can pull into them on a daily basis. So what we thought was that this paradox was pretty interesting. And if you're a brand, how do you work through the negatives? Um, or how do you deal with or recognize the negatives and accentuate the positives? If you're trying to cut through the clutter uh, in a world where consumers are now not paying attention to you, in fact, they have four different things going on, what does this mean to you as you're trying to reach them? Um, especially when it can be destructive to comprehension, or at least it can diminish comprehension and task performance. Yet we found that through strategies that these individuals um, created, they, they develop ways to cope with this. Um, and that's also important, an important thing for any company or brand looking to reach young kids or young consumers that have grown up in the digital age, and that is how do you provide maybe a, a message that's integrated across multiple media and maybe one that is task focused or has a single ob objective. There was a recent study in the New York Times or an article in the New York Times titled The Water Cooler Effect Internet can be TV's friend. And it talked about how with the Super Bowl, 2010 Super Bowl, or the Winter Olympics, that one in seven viewers were watching TV and also following the sport or the events uh, on the Internet. And coincidentally, the um, Super Bowl ratings were up significantly from 2009. The Winter Olympics uh, ratings were significant. The Grammys ratings were up significantly. It shows the kind of the synergistic of, of effect of people allowing people, giving them a reason to multitask in the context of your event or program uh, in two different, you know, very popular forms of, of, um, of uh, um, media, media. This is Yvette. Yvette is a Dutch woman, but she also she says, go Huskies. That's not in Dutch. Um, does anyone know? I don't know how that would be. But Yvette works for Rabobank. Rabobank is one of the largest European banks, a uh, multi-billion dollar bank. And she works for them. She's not, well, she's not a real person. She's a virtual uh, representation of what we think she should look like. She's a computer-mediated persona. She's an avatar. The neat thing about Yvette is that She's one of a, a growing number of company of virtual agents employed by companies. They don't have to pay her, though. She works for free. Uh, if you've shopped at IKEA, you might have come across Anna, Louise um, with eBay in France, Sergeant Star. The U.S. Army even has a virtual agent to help um, prospective um, people people um, interested in enlisting in the army. The neat thing about Yvette is that she goes beyond just ask her a question, she answers the question based upon some predetermined database of responses. She's not just uh, you know, a static, passive, frequently asked question um, answerer. The thing I would ask about IKEA or other agents in the past, can they really foster knowledge, consumer skills, um, any type of social connection, and can they enhance attitudes um, towards companies that employ them? And what is their return on investment, or what is their impact on the organization? And these are some research questions we wanted to look at with regard to online agents like Yvette um, in the banking contest. So if you think about a young 16-year-old or 18-year-old walking into a bank, they might even ask really seemingly you know, ignorant questions like, what is a bank? Or what, what do bankers do? What is banking and how can it benefit me? What do I need to do as a customer of a bank? How do I save? What are interest rates? What do they mean? Um, what's expected of me if I'm, for instance, applying for a, a used car loan? Yvette, in, a, in I think a brilliant stroke of um, strategy, has been placed by Rabobank far beyond the um, confines of the bank. She's on Hives, which is the Dutch version of Facebook. And at this point in time, she had about 700 friends, real people who friended her on Facebook. Uh, this shows her profile, what she likes, where she dances, what she eats, um, some of her friends. Um, do they realize that she's not a real person? I don't know. But they're still adopting her as a friend. Now, what self-respecting 16-year-old is going to, going to friend some anonymous person who works at a bank? But they do with Yvette. So many perceive her as a friend. Um, they can interact with her, and some even add her to their social networks. People seek her advice, and some even ask her out. She politely declines. Um, but I think interesting to us as researchers was she's an agent in this consumer socialization process, meaning 
companies helping consumers become more confident, more knowledgeable, um, gain more self-efficacy, and social acceptance with, I mean, banks are not always friendly, warm, inviting places. Um, and that was important for Rabobank in attracting the 16 to 22 year old consumer segment. Sorry, another model. But the important things here is Yvette could convey both functional and social information. In other words, um, she could be friendly and, and ask, well, you'll see some screenshots, but she could converse and, and, and um, dialogue with consumers on a, on a social basis. How are things going? How was your party last week? Also functional basis in, um, in terms of um, this is what our interest rates are at Rabobank. Then we wanted to know what was the impact of the content she was able to deliver in a functional or social manner as well as in a proactive or reactive manner, which sets her apart from these F FAQ type um, age, online agents. We wanted to know how does that affect our confidence level, our, our feeling of self-efficacy, our social acceptance, and our knowledge about the bank itself, and what is her the result of her performance on bank outcomes, like uh, credit accounts. Um, um, there were four metrics that were important to Rabobank in terms of financial metrics. So because she can convey functional and social content, she can be proactive. She has a memory of what, uh, what Bob, you might have talked to Yvette last week, and you went to Barcelona, and Yvette will ask you when you talk to her you know, in a, in a week or two subsequent, how was your trip to Barcelona, Bob? How was the hotel you stayed in? So she's programmed to be able to tap into past conversations with consumers and bring those conversations to bear in current conversations. So here's an example of a chat. Um, Yvette says, hey, you ask her, how are you doing, Yvette? You know, you log in and you open up your MSN chat window. You ask her how she's doing. You say, she says, I'm good, but my car broke down this morning. I got to work late. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. And she says, yeah, it's okay. I'm still alive, but by the way, how was your trip to Barcelona? Oh, thanks for remembering. So this is a very unusual dialogue between a bank and a 18, 19 year old um, prospective um, user of, of the bank. So you say, yeah, I had a great time. Have you been to Barcelona? You're treating her as a, as a friend, um, not as a representative of this faceless bank. And she says, yeah, I'd like to go there. Can you re recommend a hotel? So you can see the conversation is still at a social level, but she's being pretty proactive by drawing upon past interactions to current conversations. So you say you stayed at a hotel. Now notice this really cool segue from social to good thing that you applied for your credit card with Rabobank before you left. Were you able to use it? Yeah, it came in handy. We were out at night and I had to use it to pay for dinner. So these are you know, um, translations of actual conversations that happen with um, uh, people that are uh, interacting with Yvette online. The results were that being functional, delivering functional information directly related to the bank was really important for, um, uh, for the um, people that were interacting with her. They wanted ultimately to know how they could work with the bank and what interest rates were and how much a credit card cost. But being proactive separated the, um, the effect of the functional by a significant effect. So when she was reactive, yeah, functional content was good. By being proactive, um, it was really, really good. We also noticed that being too social in these interactions um, created diminishing returns. There was like an inverted U shape uh, where socialness to a degree helped, but after a while it became uh, irritating and the person, the user who was trying to, you know, find out more about the bank wanted, you know, give me the meat. Um, so I guess ultimately I'd like to close with the fact that I think persuasion is all what some of us mentioned tonight. It's about what's in it for me. It's about giving something, giving me something that I'm interested in. Or in these words, it's about intimacy plus engagement plus relevance plus um, the context or location divided by the clutter, meaning the, the stuff, the, the messages that we have to put up with individuals, um, commercial messages um, every day. So I think, you know, this is just um, my humble opinion, but behavioral targeting will be in a, a, a really significant influence on online marketing. That is, companies um, like DoubleClick or Google or others' ability to track us online, whether we know it or not, uh, track our histories and our um, behaviors, what we do with our um, 
I think this um, research stream looking at online agents, socialization agents, um, is, is pretty interesting for the future. And then this idea of social commerce, which is social media with the added um, benefit of, of easing transactions online. You might have heard of Disney tickets together with Facebook. It's, a, it's an application layered on top of Facebook that now allows people to buy and invite, buy tickets to Ms. Disney movies and invite their friends without leaving Facebook. So it's a, this totally integrated uh, transaction model that Facebook and Disney have, um, have developed. Do you all know what this is? One of my last closing slides. Quick response code or a smart code. And what happens when with your phone, this is like barcodes are passe. This is the future. You see an ad, maybe a store window, um, a magazine ad, or any two-dimensional object with this. You can snap it with your um, camera phone, and it just um, you know opens up the world to um, the brand. Um, maybe it's a, a shoe or a car, and you can access all types of information, videos, content related to um, a, a pretty static two-dimensional um, advertisement. So smart codes are um, growing. You know, usage the usage of smartphones are growing in the future. And then finally, another. Um, thing we're working on in terms of writing um, case studies is this use of social media. This was a campaign put together for the Grammys in 2010. It's scraping the internet real time for content related to Lady Gaga, and then bringing it up on the um, on the individual computer screen. So it looks at all the content around the world in this you know global internet related to Lady Gaga, scrapes it real time, and then brings it to you in form in the form of YouTube videos, tweets on Twitter. Uh, Facebook comments about people that you're interested in. Um, in this case, the Grammys put it together with about 20 of their musicians that were being featured on the show, and it was a, a pretty big success. We're working with the agency, um, Shiat Day in LA, to um, uh, to look at that and kind of you know put it in case study form to present it to our students.